Hello everybody, wherever in the world you are joining us from. I'm Stephen Durkin, CEO of Oz IMM, and thrilled to welcome you to the fifth and final event in our 2020 Thought Leadership Online series. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. We proudly recognise their strong connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging, emerging and extend our respect to traditional custodians everywhere around the world. It's great to see so many people online again today. Uh, in a way, it's a shame that this is the last time that we will be meeting for this series. It's been a great success. We've welcomed uh, 900 regist registrants from uh, 41 countries around the world over the past few weeks. It's been great to see people checking in from, from Brisbane, from Jakarta, from London, even Mauritius, from all over the world. People have come together as part of this online series. Our international audience has absolutely reinforced the very global nature of our industry and the international orientation of OzIMM. Uh, as uh, the peak body leading the way for people working in the resources sector, we're proud to represent at OzIMM 13,000 professionals living and working all over the world. We're delighted that we're able to bring together people to discuss our collective future and share a very exciting vision for the future of the resources sector. Sadly, as I said, our series ends today, but it's on a real highlight with the discussion that I'm sure you've all been looking forward to. We're joined by former NASA astronaut, Pamela Melroy, who has commanded a space shuttle and spent 38 days in space. Pamela will be sharing her insights into space exploration and mining, including a discussion of the skills and the capabilities in the resources sector and how these can translate to space projects. As with all of our thought leadership series, uh, the discussion here today is deliberately forward looking and big picture. Please join in the conversation and ask your questions via the online platform and we'll get in as many of those questions as we can. Before we begin, I would like to thank our series partners who have been such a huge part of the success of this series and for making the event possible. We partner with leading organisations who share our values and are proud of the very strong connection we have built with these organisations. Thank you in particular to our signature partner, PwC, major partners, the So Systems, Nets Ignited and Rio Tinto, in fact, all of our series and supporting partners. It's now my great pleasure to hand over to our MC, Kat Matson, to kick off today's conversation. Kat has, in her own right, a very strong reputation in digital innovation. We've been thrilled that Kat's been such an important part of the series and it's just been grown expertise to this event. Also a very popular and talented MC, as I'm sure you're about to find out. You're in for a very fun and interesting session. Thank you. Enjoy the conversation. Over to Kat. Thank you so much, Stephen. And uh, hello, good morning, good evening to everyone who is watching. Uh, we obviously have some regular attendees. Uh, good morning to uh, Peter from Brisbane. Good evening, would it be, to Henny from France. And of course, good evening to Pamela, who's joined us from the States. Before I bring Pamela into the conversation, um, yes, please let us know where you are participating from today. Just click on the little blue hand in the top right hand corner of your screen where it says to ask a question and just let us know where you're watching from. Um, it's one of the things that I've loved about taking this particular series online this year that we can reach audiences all around the world. And in fact, we're of course talking today with someone who is feet firmly planted on earth today, but as Stephen mentioned, has spent 38 days in space, um, piloted two missions, commanded one, um, spent time with Lockheed Martin, um, has spent time um, with the Federal Aviation Administration, and I think probably most excitingly, because I'm an internet geek at heart, has her own Wikipedia page. Would you please welcome with, you know, virtual applause, Pamela Melroy. Um, Pamela, where actually in the States are you joining us from today? Yes, hello, Kat. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. Um, I'm on the east coast of the United States. Uh, I live just outside Washington, D.C. in the Virginia area. Lovely, lovely. And what's the, uh, what's the weather like today? Oh, it's a, it's a beautiful uh, day that's uh, coming up to autumn here. So um, the leaves aren't quite ready to change this far south, but uh, uh, at least 
uh, we have leaves to change. We're all keeping the folks in California and Oregon in our thoughts um, uh, because there are some serious fires out there. And I know that you know in Australia what bushfires mean and, and how dangerous they are. So keep keep those folks in your thoughts. Yeah, we certainly are, and you're right. We um we sadly do know what that level of bushfire or wild wildfire means. As I scroll through the hellos, um, we do have a lot of people joining us from Australia uh, today. We've got lots of Brisbaneites, Perth, Melbourne. Um, thoughts are with our friends in Melbourne. They are in um, the most significant lockdown um, restrictions um, at the moment. Poor. Yeah, poor Melburnians. So um, our thoughts are going out to them. Just while we do that, Pamela, I'm noticing that we're having some tech issues. So can you turn your camera off and on again um, for me while I say hello to who else? We've got people from Perth. We've got Adelaide. Hello. Um, it is fantastic to have everyone here. And here comes Pamela back. Awesome. Tell us awesome. your story. Tell us your story. Oh, thank you so much, Kat. I, I have to say... I am very excited to be here because uh, this is just a subject I'm very interested in and uh, very excited about. And uh, hopefully you'll get a sense for why that is as I go forward. So uh, space mining, I mean, how crazy cool is that, right? I mean, it evokes all these amazing science fiction-y kind of thoughts, right? You know, wow, you know, it, there's tons of movies uh, that you can, and books and things like that. And so, you know, I would like to actually just talk about what aspects are real and what are not and, and what it real, what, you know, what the potential is for the future. So uh, one thing that is very real is uh, that there's tremendous potential out there uh, for asteroids to be mined. And uh, so probably one of the most famous bodies in the solar system that outside of planetary scientists you've never heard of um, is called Psyche. And it's an asteroid uh, that scientists believe was actually the core of a small planetary body. But what's unusual about it, instead of like sort of rocks and minerals and dust and maybe a little bit of ice, this thing is 90% nickel and iron. And uh, that is not a typo. The estimate for the value of that metal is uh, 10,000 quadrillion US dollars. So NASA is actually sending a probe to Psyche. It's launching in 2022. It will take four years to get there. And uh, we will learn a lot about this extremely interesting and bizarre asteroid. But the truth is there's some tremendous minerals and, uh, and things to, to mine out there. Uh, but now I'm, I'm going to uh, bring us back down just a little bit. So Psyche, for example, um, our favorite target is 349 million kilometers away. So uh, that's almost seven times as far away as the moon. It's out in the asteroid belt. It would take you four years to travel there. The cost for transportation is estimated. This is about what it costs uh, NASA to send things to Mars. Uh, and it's only just a little bit further, uh, 100,000 kilograms, uh, 100,000 U.S. dollars per kilogram. That's the cost of one way. Um, in addition to that, one of the huge challenges in space is, of course, you cannot use any kind of combustion engine because you don't have air. It's, it's a vacuum. So uh, you have to have some other form of energy source. And the most common one is uh, solar cells, uh, but you know the largest solar cells uh, in existence in space are on the International Space Station, and they're not even close to generating the two megawatts that's needed for excavation operations. So uh, you better bring a very large solar array with you. And in fact, the further away that you get from the sun, of course, the irradiance drops. And so uh, you're now talking um, some really terrible difficulties in deep space. And uh, finally, you know, the equipment, the people that you're sending, uh, how to maintain them and what you have kind of life support and to keep it operating, we have no idea. There, there are really no estimates uh, for, for how much that's gonna cost. So frankly, it, it's just a little bit of a bummer of a business case. It doesn't uh, doesn't really close uh, very easily right now. 
Uh, one of the biggest issues actually uh, with this is that there's no customer in situ. If there was a, a, a customer in situ, that would make a big difference. And, and one of the uh, one of the discussions has been about bootstrapping. You know, maybe you know you mine enough to build equipment that you need to mine, and you build solar arrays and so forth. But it's um, it's a pretty huge investment uh, to uh, to basically have uh, yourself be the only customer. Uh, but I have to say that it's this is not as uh, depressing as it sounds. Getting out to the asteroid belt is very, very difficult, but there's something going on in the space community uh, that's beginning to change the story. So I'll have to take a step back and talk about space exploration for a moment. This is the International Space Station. I spent my career as an astronaut building the space station. My first trip was before there were even humans uh, living and working on board. And uh, each piece of the station was brought up one piece at a time. Uh, it was assembled in space through a series of robotics and spacewalks. And it is a multinational investment. That's the name of it, the International Space Station. 23 countries have come together and uh, they send uh, crew members to space. They send science uh, to the National Laboratory in space. And essentially they have pooled their resources. And uh, it's been a tremendous investment because uh, we're getting science investment out of it, the science of microgravity. Uh, but I think uh, one of the most important things is we've really learned how to live in space for long periods of time. So most crew members stay up for about six months at a time, but we have had crew members stay in, st in space, in microgravity for a year, which has a pretty substantial impact on the human body. We've learned about perpetual operations, not just up and down the way we did in the shuttle, what it's like to actually sustain 24 seven operations. Well, the space station's go going to go until about either 2024, 2028, maybe a little bit longer. But the whole world is looking ahead to what's next. And what's next is the moon. So NASA has started a program called Moon to Mars. And many countries in Australia have already stepped up to the plate to say that they want to be a part of this multinational global exploration. What is the next step? So in 2024, uh, the United States plans to return humans uh, to the surface of the moon, uh, but for a longer investment, we'd like to sustain it. This isn't going to be like Apollo, where we visited and then came home. This is going to be about building the capability to live and work on the surface of the moon and practice and rehearse for going to Mars, which is much further away. One of the most important aspects of this is here is your customer. You have many countries who are planning on investing in this, and now you have an in situ customer on the surface of the moon. That's really important. But the next most important thing is that all of those customers also need to subsidize routine transportation uh, to and from the surface of the Earth to the moon. And in fact, with the changes in the, in the space environment, there are now many commercial players, uh, some you'd probably recognize like SpaceX, others you may not know like Astrobotic, that are all uh, uh, working in partnership with NASA and with other space agencies to develop a commercial capability to provide routine transportation. So the story is definitely looking quite a bit different now when you compare the moon to, to an asteroid. So what is it actually we want on the moon? That's a pretty harsh and unforgiving place. Well, the number one thing we want, I already referred to it once, in situ resource utilization. So it is expensive to transport things from the earth to the moon. So if you can figure out how to extract resources that are useful, it will save you a lot of time and a lot of money instead of bringing whatever that resource is. So this looks like a, 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 a you know, I mean, we're all familiar with, okay, we're uh, going to cut down a tree and build a house or, or take some stones and build a house and so forth. This doesn't look very, very friendly. But in fact, we do think that the, the moon has something that we need very badly, and that is water. Now, you might take a look at that and say, 
I don't see any water there, but in fact, we think that there, we know that there's water in the shadowed reg regions of the South Pole. Um, in addition to that, uh, some scientists believe that there is water that's bonded to the dirt, but it's just below the surface, much like we found on Mars. And why is water important? Well, it turns out water is rocket fuel. Yes, that's what we used. We used hydrogen and oxygen uh, to launch the space shuttle uh, fired through their main engines. So propellant is an inc incredibly useful and valuable thing to have. So if we could extract water from the moon, there will be a lot of customers in place. So not just the transportation, but it will also be used for scientific experiments, for cooling of equipment, and of course, to keep people alive. So when I lived in Australia in 2018, and I took a look around uh, the tech community, one of the things that really blew me away was Australia's world leading capability in remote asset management. And uh, one of the things that really, really clicked with me is uh, it's uh, difficult and expensive and it's going to take uh, time uh, to get humans to the surface of the moon. And it's dangerous. And so we're going to need to only send people when they have the most value added, certain types of scientific exploration and so forth. So we're going to have to do a lot of this as what we call human tended, meaning people will come, uh, but they will only stay for a period of time, which means the rest of the time it needs to run without humans there. So uh, remote asset management capability, not just the excavation, uh, but the transportation and the logistics, both of those pieces are very, very important and highly relevant to uh, extracting water. And potentially there are some other resources that we could extract from the moon later on, but water is definitely um, the, uh, the most important resource. So uh, I look at this and I, I, I saw this and I said, this is, you know, fantastic. So one of the things that I did when I was living in Australia and have continued is uh, recognizing that we need to build up Australian capability in remote asset management for space. It's fantastic for uh, mining and other and, and uh, resource extraction on the surface of the earth, but there are some key differences in space. And so um, uh, uh, the company that I'm a part of and several other companies were the founding partners for AROSE, the Australian Remote Operations for Space and Earth. It's a nonprofit consortium that is project-based, designed to bring aerospace and resource companies together to work together on problems that have applicability here on Earth, but are also preparing us to do remote asset management in space. And uh, I'm personally very excited about AROSE, and I, I'm excited about Australia's capability in this, in this area. So um, that concludes my slides. I think we should go right to our questions and have a discussion, Kat. I'm so excited to talk about this. Let's, and I, I love hearing that you're excited to talk about this because I think your perspective of having, of course, been in space and assemb assembling uh, the International Space Station, but now taking it beyond that and looking at what are the potentials for resource discovery, mining and so on, I think is just, it's extraordinary. Before we jump into, uh, I'm going to come back to that whole asteroid and nickel asteroid, <laughs> sorry, that nickel and iron asteroid. But the remote asset capable management capability is a really interesting one because there's a, there's a populist narrative in Australia that mining is bad, mining is evil, um, we don't want to keep digging stuff up, but yet Obviously, because we have be, we have such expertise in mining and resources across harsh environments, we've got this capability. So to those in the industry, how can they be looking forward and taking their remote asset management capability and starting to prepare for space exploration, whether it's asteroids or the moon? Well, I, you know, I have to say, I think uh, a rose was the step that I thought was very important. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it's a little bit of a different operating environment. And uh, just as if you decided uh, to go and do resource extraction 
in a country that you had never been to, the first thing that you want to do is understand that country, uh, perhaps find a local guide, a partner, um, understand the culture, understand what the challenges of operating uh, there are and how things work. And so I think that's, that's the big step I think that has to be taken by mining companies is to get out there and partner with, uh, with those who really understand space. And that can be uh, government or it can be commercial partners. Uh, the government is going to be an anchor tenant in, in a lot of ways. You know, NASA has, has really uh, demonstrated that in commercial transportation to and from uh, the International Space Station. It is now being conducted by commercial companies to carry cargo, and we just had the first test to prove that you can carry crew commercially to and from the station. So uh, there are commercial entities, but there are also government entities, and that partnership is going to be critical to build the knowledge that's needed. So we're already seeing um, that partnership between um, private operators and government. Um, we've got a question from Sir Khan from our University of New South Wales, um, who's asking what role do universities have to play in that collaboration in the mining space, and mining and space, uh, I should say. Great question, Sir Khan. It's, uh, it's uh, always fabulous to hear from you. Um, so I think universities are going to play a critical role. There, there's a couple pieces of it. The most obvious one is exploration. So we all understand what that means. Uh, we know what that means on the earth. It's let's go find it. Where is it? Uh, we have some ideas uh, on, on the moon, uh, but there are a lot of questions. NASA is actually sending uh, a very, very small payload to the moon called Viper, um, looking for volatiles and trying to understand how much water is bonded to the dust and the dirt. So uh, there really is a critical role uh, that scientists play in understanding where to find the resources on the, on the moon. And, um, and I, we're going to have to probably come up with some new ways of extracting uh, those resources as well. Uh, I think there's, there's just, it's a, it's a very rich area, but I think there's also a lot of applied research that's going to be needed to adapt the systems and processes uh, and particularly the modeling and analysis that we have today to the moon because it's completely different than the Earth. <laughs> uh, yeah, completely different, completely. Um, well, not completely. <laughs> oh, pretty different. Pretty yeah, different. There's, there's, there's similarities in terms of desert, um, harsh. That's about it. <laughs> well, um, actually, uh, the, the, the theory is that the moon was once a part of the Earth, so there are some similarities, which could be very interesting really? to see in the, yes, in the, in the makeup of the moon. It would be very, very interesting. But that is, that is the, the current theory. Oh, I didn't know about that. That's really cool. Um, while we're talking about water on the moon, another audience question um, come from, comes from Imance. And um, Imance is asking, are there any ideas about the ballpark volumes of water on the moon? And what are your early thoughts about sustainability? Yeah, good question. There, there are some estimates that came, um, you know, how cool is this? Now talk about exploration. Uh, uh, there was a, a satellite that was mapping uh, the moon called LCROSS. That's, I can't remember what the acronym standard for, stands for. Um, but since there was a guess that there might be water, uh, this was maybe back in 2010 or 11, uh, a decision was taken to crash L-Cross into the South Pole and then look at it very closely with telescopes and see if you saw any, any water uh, come up from the crash. So that's sort of a novel way to do exploration, I think. Uh, but in fact, uh, they did see water. And so there's, there are estimates, but right now uh, uh, those, those numbers are pretty imprecise. Uh, but I, there's pretty high confidence that there is certainly enough to sustain uh, a moon base. Uh, and there's probably enough to provide the propellant that's needed. The beauty of the propellant situation is if you're not coming out of the gravity well of Earth, 
you need less propellant just to get up into orbit. We'll probably use other systems that go back and forth from, from the surface of the moon, but, but there's going to be a need for lunar orbit to the surface, and that's the number one need, and of course, operating equipment as well. Tara, I feel I feel like I'm having a conversation about sci-fi, but this is actually, it's quite real. It's extraordinarily possible. Um, on the sustainability issue, I think this is an interesting one. Um, it, it occurred to me when you were talking about the asteroid. Um, human beings as a species and as a race, um, we don't have a spectacular track record of um, managing our mining, managing what we take out of the Earth. Um, what's kind of, do you have any concerns about us um, ruining other, well, the moon or asteroids? Like how, what's in place or what are the conversations that are happening in place around sustainable mining of space? Right. That's a, that's a great question. So I'll, I'll start with um, really the fundamental piece of space law, um, which granted is somewhat untested. Uh, but it's the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. Yes, it goes all the way back to that point. But one of the interesting aspects of the Outer Space Treaty is that it did allow for commercial activity. If you think back to 1967, it was only nation states that were going to space. And really, that's been true until fairly recently. But there was a clause that said that each country had a responsibility to oversee the safe operations of, of all of their activities in space, not just those carried out by the government, but those that are carried out by commercial entities as well. So there is a burden and a responsibility on each nation that sends things to space or allows them, commercial entities, to launch things to space and do things in space to have continuing oversight of that. So uh, that's the first thing that's that's a good precedent. I think that's a very important precedent, and um, most of the countries in the world are signatories to the Outer Space Treaty. After that, it does start to get a little bit murky. Um, if if you don't actually really understand the pristine state, how do you ensure that you are not doing any damage? Um, there are some things that are much simpler. Uh, for example, um, we don't believe there's any form of life on the moon. That could be wrong. We might find microbial life where there's water. That would definitely be something that would need to be investigated. Uh, but, but in general, um, the, it's, it's a long story, and I won't bore you with the science, but we actually think that water is likely very pristine and actually carries a geological record with it. So that would be a very important aspect. I personally think that uh, that Australia is well positioned. I think it, I can think of a lot of other countries that are much less responsible. So I personally think that Australia is well positioned to take a leadership role in defining what safe and sustainable operations need to be. And uh, one of the most interesting things, you know, the Australian Space Agency only started in 2018. But you don't need to spend a lot of money to be smart and to be a leader in space policy. And uh, so as, as I look at the country, I think you're in the best position to take leadership role. That's incredibly reassuring, I have to say, Pamela. And I actually take comfort from the fact that perhaps back in 1967, when the Outer Space Treaty was created, we actually then put in place better governance than we have for the Earth in terms of taking you know, nation states, taking responsibility for all activity. Um, and I particularly like that we've got the opportunity for some policy leadership in that space. Pardon the pun. Um, <laughs> um, I've got, there are so many questions coming through. Thank you everyone for asking them. I'm gonna do my best to get to them. A reminder, if you haven't asked a question and if you have one, use the little blue hand on the top right hand corner of your screen. Also, a reminder that as a thought leadership conversation, I make no apologies for leaving you with more questions than answers. Um, so, you know, this isn't a how-to, this is a what-if conversation. So speaking of questions, I've got two that I'm going to wrap up into one. So George asks, are there any, what are your thoughts 
on techniques to extract water from the moon. And then Peter has also asked and wondered, how does mining work, given that ex the explosives that we use on Earth need oxygen? Right. This is uh, actually a critical issue. And that's one of the reasons why I brought it up right up front. It's like, OK, no oxygen, no air. Uh, you have to take that into consideration from e everything that you're doing. Uh, I think um, this is a big challenge. Um, and, you know, uh, Sir Khan asked a question earlier about universities and research. And uh, I, I know that there are a lot of very interesting research threads going on around diff different ways to extract material. Uh, I think um, uh, that, that, in fact, around the world, there have been people who have been looking at lunar regolith simulant. Um, you know, the problem is, as you know very well, it's like, well, is it really, is it tiny you know, fragments of dust or is it chunks of rock? And of course you have uh, different qualities and the extraction uh, mechanisms really depend on that. Uh, so I think there's some interest in looking at chemical uh, forms. There's uh, been some discussion about, um, about baking uh, uh, regolith and some other things, but um, I mean, really, so you may not have caught this, this, made waves in the space community a couple days ago, but NASA just announced that they would pay anyone, and I think it's $10,000 a kilogram or something like that, for lunar, real lunar regolith. And uh, it's sort of left as an exercise to the commercial company how they're gonna go get it. Uh, and in fact, uh, um, there's no deadline for like returning it to the earth uh, because there's not a regular transportation mechanism yet. Um, but I, I do think, I actually think this isn't that unreasonable. If you stop and look at um, basic excavation capability, I mean, we should be talking about things like converting um, excavation machines to solar power, right? That's what we're looking for. And, you know, the power piece is very important. You know, if you have the surface to set up a large solar array, particularly with some of the power beaming and concentrating capabilities, uh, there's a lot of people who feel like um, radioisotope generators, which is you know, basically a, a piece of radioactive material that's inert. It's not, you know, fizzing or fissioning, but it's letting off um, particles and it actually generates heat that can be converted into electricity. And NASA has made has has had several of those to go for deep space exploration. And that may turn out to be an answer, too. But um you know, we're going to have to convert some of that equipment to uh, solar electric. And now that I think about it, doesn't that sound like a good idea here, too? Doesn't it indeed? And in fact, I'm actually laughing with in the innovation circles. Um, we often joke that space discovery, space travel has driven many of the innovations that we take um, for granted today. So uh, here it is again, that push to go further. Um, on that um, incentive that you mentioned, NASA paying um, for a pound off the lunar circuit surface, we actually had a question about that. Um, and Joe actually asks, um, does that give us the, or does that give the green light for free fall explore, exploitation of the moon? And I guess it follows up then with some other questions around, is, what's the governance around what gets discovered? Is it finders keepers at the moment? Yeah, it's a great question. So I talked about the Outer Space Treaty because it, it is really important to understand that wrapper. Uh, that is the main governance. Uh, when you start to get down to these questions, it gets much trickier. There are some people who uh, do not believe uh, that if you extract a kilogram of, of regolith that, that you then own it. Um, the United States has taken a position that you do. Um, I think, uh, you know, the way I view this, uh, and, and certainly I think there's some real potential for this, and again, I'd like to see Australia take leadership in this. Uh, if you think about mining um, on the earth, you, you don't just go out somewhere and start digging. There are licenses 
and environmental assessments and things that have to be done. There is, in fact, an oversight regime. Now, it, it, people can argue about whether it's completely adequate or if it covers everything, but there is a regime around that. And I think that's where we're going to have to go for bodies out in space as well. Certainly the moon, which uh, I think, you know, nobody would argue is uh, part of the heritage of mankind, right? I mean, it's, it's in Earth orbit. And so uh, I think that's something, there's going to have to be a governance structure around how, what, what, how, do, how do countries get together and give each other permission to do things like that. I think that's missing right now uh, where, where there's, what is, the, what is the process by which that follows? Um, one of the things that's very interesting, having worked on policy, particularly space policy for uh, many years now, is that no one ever comes up with a process or an answer until somebody actually wants to go do it. And uh, in my view, I think that's the most interesting thing about NASA throwing um, down this challenge because someone's going to come in and say, yep, I'd like to do this. And then we have to figure it out. And it will get all the players to the table to figure out, you know, what is okay, what isn't, what is the process that needs to be followed. So there's definitely more work to be done in that area. Mm. And it, you're right. It's we, we we those policies will be informed by the actions that are taken. Um, oh, geez, so many things to talk to you about, Pamela, and not enough time. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to. There's a couple, a couple more mining questions, and then I want to indulge a little bit in just some general space, um, space stuff. Um, Andrew Jenkins is asking a really interesting question. Um, he's saying, what are the most likely activities that a rose will fund or facilitate to achieve its objectives? So uh, we we actually have a couple of projects uh, underway. Um, the uh, I, th I think really our criteria is uh, that there is uh, benefit both to um, terrestrial operations and, and and we're casting the net broader than just resource uh, extraction. Remote asset management, of course, uh, applies to uh, agriculture and um, in many other areas now. So uh, the, the goal would be to, uh, you know, Again, I mean, actually, the kind of um, thing I talked about a few minutes ago. How do you how do you change an excavator to operate in the absence of air? Right. Those are the kinds of projects that would be very very interesting. Now, that doesn't necessarily apply terrestrially, but if you wanted to convert it to an electric vehicle, that would be highly relevant. And uh, you know, we think particularly in the area of uh, robotics. I think, and um, and maybe some of these novel ways of extracting materials. I think those are, are things, but really, I mean, there's tremendous overlap between space and Earth in this area. Uh, I mean, when we think about um, space, we think about the tech companies or the SpaceXs of the world. Um, are any of the um, established mining companies investing heavily in this kind of innovation, preparing for space exploration, or is it kind of sitting off to the side at the moment? Uh, well, if I knew, I probably couldn't tell you because they wouldn't want me to talk about it. I'm thinking, um, you know, that's something that's obviously going to have to change at some point. I mean, I understand mm -hmm. the way the mining companies work today. Uh, competitive advantage is, is, is a real challenge. Uh, this is going to be something very different. Um, yes. uh, it will require... Um, open discussion of intentions and plans uh, because, of course, the customer is going to be a consortium of governments. And so uh, there does have to be, you know, understanding and there will be huge interest in it. So um, I can say that uh, I have heard a lot from people at mining companies that they're interested, they're intrigued, they're looking at it. Uh, one of the things that I was excited about doing this talk is to talk a little bit fact from fiction, right? Let's not talk mm -hmm. about asteroids, uh, but the moon is a, is a real thing. Uh, so, um, I, you know, I, I really would like to see mining companies beginning to think about this. 
because because the business case is is likely going to close for for the moon much sooner than anybody thinks. Yeah, cool. For those watching, we are going to go five minutes over time because we lost that five minutes in the middle where the tech just didn't do its thing. So, um, you know, send your text messages to your next meeting to let them know that you're having a conversation with an astronaut and sorry, that wins today. <laughs> um, <laughs> honestly, if you can't stay, uh, the video will be available later on to watch again. Um, Another question that's come through in terms of what the opportunities that might exist on the moon in terms of non-volatiles, for example, to support the building of habitats. Now, that's a really interesting one. Um, what what are you seeing there? That's exactly right. So um, the this, this second, uh, second resource, I think, uh, that everyone thinks about is, is lunar regolith uh, for exactly that um, capability. So there's um, some ex small scale experiments going on with uh, trying to figure out how to make bricks. Um, but, um, you know, you need to not have to carry too much equipment with you. Uh, I think someone was successful in just using very high pressure to mash it, uh, the dirt into, into a brick. Um, you know, believe it or not, one of the big hazards to humans and equipment on the moon is radiation. So in low Earth orbit, there are higher levels of radiation than there are here on the surface of the Earth. But once you get out of the protection of the Van Allen radiation belt, which is uh, you know a magnetic field that shunts the uh, most extreme particles away from the Earth and protects us uh, here on the Earth, there's no such protection on the moon. And so the radiation hazard uh, to equipment and people is very serious. So one of the speculations about how to use regolith is simply, you know, you can construct a habitat, but you're going to want to pack uh, regolith around it to use as radiation shielding. So um, that that is definitely something. I mean, there are even people talking about using lunar regolith to make solar cells out of, which would be really awesome. I mean, that would be uh, a very, very useful thing to do. Uh, finally, it, it, a more extreme uh, condition, but there is helium-3 in abundance uh, on the moon. It is a very rare um, isotope here on the Earth, but it's in abundance on the moon. And why helium-3 is interesting is that it can create a non-radioactive energy source. Uh, that is very powerful. So uh, that would be that would be a very interesting. A lot of people speculate that long term, that's going to be the most valuable resource that gets extracted. Cool. That that's that's quite extraordinary, actually, when you think about building solar panels out of material off the lunar surface. Um, yeah. I've got, the questions are coming through so thick and fast. We're just trying to filter them. Um, what do you think about the viability of, of accessing resources from near or start again? What do you think about the viability of accessing resources from near Earth objects to supply a moon facility? And for numpties like me, what do we mean by near Earth objects? <laughs> yes. Okay. It's a great question. So um, there are a lot of asteroids in the asteroid belt. Uh, in the outer reaches of the solar system. And then there are some on very elliptical orbits that come whizzing in. Uh, so they pass very close to the sun or very, very close to the earth uh, as they're going around and around. So uh, we're worried about those things. We're mostly worried about them because we're worried about them hitting the earth and, um, and you know, creating um, a serious damage uh, Anyway, it, you know, you can only imagine how bad it would be if it was a large enough asteroid. Uh, you know, it would be the end of the Earth if it was big enough. Uh, so uh, those, the problem with near-Earth objects, uh, it's actually a very interesting situation. There was some analysis done around this. Um, the, the orbital mechanics are such that the closer it gets to the sun, the faster it's moving. And these things... Um, are moving very, very fast relative to the Earth as they come in and whiz around the sun because they're from the outer solar system. So the problem is it gets really complicated to do the astrodynamics, to do a rendezvous 
with something that's moving that fast and moving away from you that fast. So um, I think samples um, is certainly possible. I think that would be a very intriguing and exciting um, uh, technical challenge, although we're, you know, Hayabusa, Bennu, uh, you know, we've got asteroid uh, sample uh, missions that are out psyche. I don't think they're going to take a sample. I think they're just going to look at it. Uh, but then when you have to add the energy required to get from this very fast moving uh, near Earth asteroid back to the moon, I don't think that's going to close. That's a lot of propellant. And uh, yeah, it just sounds too complicated. Um, I'm going to um, ask a couple of um, more experiential questions about your time in space before we start wrapping up, because sadly, we are going to need to wrap up very soon. Um, I've got to ask, 38 days in space, what is it like to be in space? Well, it's, you know, on a personal level, it's really extraordinary. Um, the sensation of microgravity, of, of floating, is uh, something that is very difficult to describe. I think we'll have to send a few more artists and poets out there to uh, give us the vocabulary uh, to be able to share that sensation. It's, um, it's really strange, uh, but it's also really fun. Um, you end up learning how to operate in a very different way. You don't need to use very much energy to move yourself around. You can literally propel yourself from one end of the space station to the next with just a fingertip uh, tapping and pushing yourself where, where you need to go. So you learn very quickly to use much lower energy and you slow everything down. Otherwise, you're literally slamming around and hitting into things, which is a classic rookie thing to do uh, when you first get to space, because you think it, it's you think you have to push off uh, to get from one end of an element to another. Um, you know, you can lift very very large things uh, uh, with just one hand uh, in microgravity, and so it it takes time to uh, sort of process that and but your body does adapt you get used to operating like that um the, the you know i think the interesting thing for me is my experience in space was flying the space shuttle uh building the international space station so um i'm an operator uh granted operating extremely far out in the field um, but it is a very very operational job and that's what's on my mind when we talk about some of these things. I'm always looking at the very practical realities. How is someone going to operate it? Is it uh, can you repair it? What's going to cause it to break down? Um, those kinds of things, because that's what we spend all our time in space thinking about. Um, there are unexpected things that happen from uh, material and equipment that operate in microgravity, and even your own body. Uh, uh, actually doesn't function exactly the same way. So, um, so we, we, you know, it's, but it, it is, it's almost like being in a magic place, right? Because you can fly. Yeah. And uh, working on this, on the International Space Station and with that perspective of being in space, I'm wondering, has that changed how you view the world's ability to collaborate and to come together where on Earth we often see I don't know. We see barriers to cooperation. We see we see man, literally man-made distinctions. Right. It's uh, I don't see those anymore. I think uh, going to space. Uh, we astronauts have a term for it. It's the overview effect, and it's the realization that the Earth is a deeply connected ecosystem and that we are the crew of the Earth and we are also uh, deeply interconnected. What that means is the idea that what we do in our country or that country or over here doesn't affect other people is actually not true. It's, it's demonstrably not true. You can see how, how interconnected the environment is. Uh, the Earth is uh, an amazingly resilient system, um, but it, it, is, it is all connected. Um, I think one of the lessons learned that I take away from the International Space Station, though, is for collaboration to work, there has to be um, some fundamental value that you share, uh, because otherwise politics gets hard, you have, start having problems, you worry about money, 
and all that other stuff. But if if um, if there is a shared belief uh, that uh, what you are doing is important, and I can tell you that every astronaut I've met from every country in the world, and I've met most of them from all uh, countries, including China, and worked closely with a lot of Russians and Europeans and a Malaysian astronaut and uh, the Korean and, 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 and everyone. And we all shared the same passion, which meant that in the end, we could always get where we needed to go because we all had the same goal. Let's operate safely. Let's do this. Let's do the science. Let's complete the construction. Uh, let's, let's be in space together as human beings and experience uh, the awe and the wonder of it together. And we all believed in that. And um, that's, I think, I have high hopes for a collaboration going to the moon uh, that we will bring out the best of humanity and think very carefully about what we're doing for the future. Geez, I hope so. I really do. I have two final questions before I hand over to Stephen to wrap us up. Um, my first is I'd love a quick comment from you as a female in a very male-dominated field. I mean, you don't hear of very many female astronauts. What can you what can you leave us again in the mining industry, which is also still um, can be seen as largely male dominated? What what was I, actually? That's my question. What is it about you as a woman in a male dominated industry that still enabled you to succeed? I think um, I, I think it's because I was really passionate about becoming an astronaut, and so when. I had issues or challenges early in my career or even in the middle of my career. Um, I was very stubborn about that. And I kept my eye on the goal and said, I'm just going to filter some of this nonsense out and I'm not going to quit. And I think, um, I think what happens, uh, I think to, to women a lot is they get tired of putting up with uh, either comments or being passed over for promotion or, or just, you know, slower than everyone else at, at, you know, being recognized for what they're doing and they quit because they say the heck with this. So I'd like to get us to a place where you don't have to be that stubborn uh, to be successful. I think um, uh, it's, it's a challenge. There's a lot of institutional changes that have to happen usually to make it work. But for me, it was because I had a dream. Beautiful. Thank you. My closing question um, has been asked by Michael in our audience and he says, just like when we sent the first astronauts to the moon and we then stood on their shoulders of giants, how do we inspire our young professionals to stand on the shoulders of giants and apply their current mining technology from their own mentors and pass on to the next crew into the space sector? Oh. Wow, what a fantastic question. I mean, that's that's what that's what I'm hoping for. And one of the things that I want to point out is, you know, you made a comment that you know, not all Australians see the mining sector as a positive area. I can tell you that um Australians view space exploration very positively. And if it is done in a safe and responsible way with clear communications, uh you are going to inspire huge numbers of students uh, to graduate and go into both mining and space because of the idea uh, that that they might be able to be a part of this, you know, grand exploration and help sustain people in space permanently uh, by by developing these technologies in a safe and responsible way. And I can tell you the students of today, they love interdisciplinary work. They just love it. So, um, yeah, the challenge is to make sure that the, the, uh, the smart people today in industry stick around and nurture uh, and encourage those students. Uh, I think we're about to have the inspiration that we needed. That is fantastic. Thank you. Pamela, thank you so much. It's been such a deliciously rich conversation. I wish we had hours more, but we don't. Um, you, you've opened my eyes to the possibilities of space mining and the opportunities, and thank you for your candor, for your warmth, and um, for 
it's just the right amount of inspiration to remind me that humanity has still got some we've we've got we've got good opportunities before us. So thank you, you and over to Stephen. Thanks, uh, thanks, Kat. Um, thanks, Pamela. It falls to me to have the, the great honour of uh, passing a, a vote of thanks today to, to Pamela and to, to Kat. I think um, that conversation you just described that beautifully, Kat, that just kind of uh, blew us all away, pardon the pun. Um, it was deliciously, deliciously rich, you said, Kat. I thought that was a perfect description of what we've covered today. I certainly found aspects of today uh, engrossing and fascinating. So thanks, uh, thanks very much, Pamela, for what you've uh, covered here today. Clearly, um, mining in space is not some wild theory. It's a, a future reality. Um, I think it's uh, been fascinating, some of, kind of, some of the concepts you've talked about. Um, you know, I kind of had never thought of this, the importance of water in terms of space mining. And um, that's kind of got me thinking uh, in a way that Kat described. This is not a, uh, this is not a how-to presentation. This is a what-if conversation. And certainly got us thinking about lots of different stuff. And it certainly got us thinking about the role of the Oz IMM in supporting this. Um, I actually wrote down what you said. Australia is well positioned to take a leadership role in defining what self and sustainable operations needs to be. And then you actually build on that and said Australia is best positioned to be a leader in space policy. So I'm now starting to think about possible collaborations of Oz IMM with CSIRO and NASA and one of the universities in Australia in terms of how we can, can bring this to life. Um, as you, as you said, you know, uh, and what you've got us thinking about is that, you know, Australia's got this unique capability of mining in harsh and remote environments and bring a lot to the table in terms of uh, both an industry and as an organisation, the professionals that we represent. So thank you so, so much, Pamela, for what you've covered today. It was inspired time and time again by what you said, but I particularly liked your reference to how connection and collaboration based on values is the key to unlocking some of this value. And I think um, as an industry, we have... A lot to be proud of and a lot to look forward to. But sadly, that conversation today brings us to the end of our Thought Leadership Series. I want to thank uh, everyone that's been a part of these discussions over the last uh, over the past few weeks. Um, the vision for this series has been to elevate, elevate our thinking and to reflect on the important role that we all play uh, in shaping the future of our sector and society. And today, uh, today's conversation has captured the absolute essence of what this series is uh, all, of, all about, looking at our industry from a range of different perspectives and angles. We hope that everyone that's uh, attended these has enjoyed the conversations. We hope that you've all had the opportunity to think differently and learn something new. Uh, if you weren't able to join us for one of the live events, the webinar recordings will be available to watch on demand. You'll have received emails uh, after each event, links to the recordings, uh, but please also keep an eye out on our website. Before we sign off, I would like to thank you, uh, thank again um, our partners in our Thought Leadership Online series, our signature partner, PwC, our major partners, the So Systems, um, Mets Ignited and Rio Tinto, and of course all of our series of supporting partners. I'd also like to thank our own OzIMM team for putting on such a fantastic event arranging such high caliber speakers. We have a very committed and dedicated small team of, uh, of staff at the Oz IMM that do a great job and I'm very proud of the work that they do. Uh, in particular, I'd like to thank our amazing, I can't think of what other superlatives I can throw in there, Kat, but our amazing, very talented uh, MC, Kat, uh, Kat Matson, who has done an absolutely incredible job today and over the last few weeks. Uh, I think you'll agree with me, Kat, has an absolute magic in terms of making you, uh, at the end of a computer, feel like you're part of a conversation, no matter what the topic is. So you've got a huge skill, and we really appreciate you, Kat, being a big part of all of this. It's been our pleasure to bring our Thought Leadership Series to you again this year. OzIMM is extremely proud to connect our global professional community and ensure that we continue to learn from each other and to find safer and more sustainable ways to create value for our society. Stay safe uh, wherever you are in the world, have a great rest of the day or evening. We appreciate your support. Thank you.